Good Sunday morning, and thank you for your interest in the Geneva class in our study of the Gospel of John. Today we come to the ninth chapter. We come to the sixth sign that Jesus performed, which is the healing of a blind man. It's a very interesting study because John is able to show us the relationship of spiritual sight to physical sight, spiritual darkness to physical darkness, and also the journey of this man himself, the man who was healed, to faith in Christ. When Christ isn't present, who is present? The Pharisees, again, trying to undermine the work of Christ. But the more they try to do that, the stronger his faith becomes. So it's an interesting study. I hope you're blessed by it. I hope you find it interesting and informative and upbuilding to your faith. And certainly I hope and pray that uh, all the material that you are about to hear and see is accurate and that God receives the glory. So we turn now to our study. The healing of the blind man, the sixth miracle. And we're going to try to take the whole chapter of uh, this, this ninth chapter of John, because there's not a good place to break it uh, and, and see the entirety of this, the flow of this narrative. So it's the beginning really of a new section in the gospel. And as scholars have looked at the gospel of John, they've identified the first four chapters as dealing with Jesus as the light coming into the world. And then chapters five through eight, and we've just finished chapter eight, dealt with Jesus coming to his own who rejected him. Recall John at the beginning said he came to his own and his own received him not. And then John goes on to say, but those to those who did receive him, he gave them the right to become the children of God. And chapters nine through 12 deal with just that, those who received him, Christ calling out a people of his own. So we're entering into that portion of the gospel of John with the sixth sign, a man born blind is able to see. And since we're dealing with light, I think we might just take a moment uh, to discuss that again, because we've seen that over and over again in the Gospel of John. That's a key word with him. But something to think about light. Light exposes sin, and we see that in the conflict with the Pharisees in chapter 8. Well, go into a dark room, you turn on the light, and you see things that you wouldn't have seen in the dark. So you turn on the light of truth, and it exposes sin. On the other hand, light fosters growth. And we see that in, in chapter 9, in this section. Light, for instance, enables plants to grow. Light is necessary for human life. So in John 8, we behold Christ as the light, exposing darkness particularly in these Pharisees. But in John 9, he communicates sight, and the man who comes to see deals with bringing light in, in the face of darkness. In John 8, the light is despised and rejected. But in John 9, he, Christ, as the light, is received and worshipped by this man, a beggar. In John 8, the Jews are seen stooping down to pick up stones. That's the last thing we saw last week. In John 9, Christ is seen stooping down to make anointing clay. These comments from Dr. Boyce. Now, there's some lessons to learn from John 8 and 9, actually from all of John. And one thing certainly is that man cannot frustrate God. Paul wrote in Romans 9, verse 15, quoting the law in Exodus, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So nothing frustrates God's plans and purposes. The hatred of man, we see that with the Pharisees, that certainly did not. The state of the lost cannot frustrate God. Job said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Now there's seven signs in the Gospel of John. We're going to be covering the sixth one today, the seventh in chapter 11. Of these seven signs, four are miracles of healing. The healing of the nobleman's son in chapter four, 
uh, the nobleman's son was at Capernaum. Uh, Jesus and his father were at Cana, but the healing takes place from Cana, many miles distant. The healing of the crippled man in chapter, chapter 5 uh, at the Pool of Bethesda. And the healing of the blind man that we're looking at today in chapter 9. And then we'll see the raising of Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11. Now, each one of these people who was healed was completely helpless. None of them could help themselves. The nobleman's son was about to die of a terrible fever. No one back in Capernaum could do anything to help him. The crippled man had been that way for 38 years, and he was unable to walk. He was even unable to get into the pool where it was believed that people would be saved or of their healed of their problems if they got in at a certain time when the water was stirred up. And the blind man, who had never seen, certainly hadn't have any capacity of healing himself. And Lazarus was dead, really dead, so he couldn't do anything. So they were all helpless. They were unable to do anything to seek Jesus. You could not say that you failed to seek him. They couldn't. And each one then shows the grace of Christ as triumphant. So let's look at the text now. John chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. As he passed by, that is Christ, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud from the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud, and he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Well, in all of these miracles, we encounter the problem of human suffering. And that is a major concern to all of humanity. But it is a concern to those of us who believe the scriptures to be true, because we wonder, why would God allow human suffering? Is God not as good as he's revealed to be? He doesn't care whether people suffer or not, or he brings it upon them and, and just lets them suffer and, and gets some kind of joy out of it? Or is he weak and simply unable to do anything about human suffering? I've had people say, when somebody is sick or dies, well, God had nothing to do with it. If God had nothing to do with human suffering, then we are in a bad situation. No, the scriptures teach plainly that God is in control of everything, sovereign over everything, and sovereign over the realm of human suffering. But... Uh, God never wastes suffering. It's carefully controlled. That expression is used by Jerry Bridges in a book that he wrote about suffering, and it's true. But there are no glib answers. We as people do not understand why God allows suffering in certain cases. It is important for us to notice that God never guarantees that the believer will be healthy. There are groups of people within the Christian world, and they uh, adhere to what's known as the health and wealth doctrine. And they believe that if you are a faithful Christian, you're obedient to God, that uh, you will not suffer any kind of physical or a mental disability. A and this is really a cruel doctrine. I remember a young man who was dying from leukemia, and he was visited by some people who believed in this, and they just simply told him that the reason that he was dying is the fact that he had sinned. And the young man broke down and cried over that. Suffering cannot be construed as a result of sin. It may be in some instances, yes, but we do not know that. And we have no right to say it. Now, in some cases, it is corrective. It's a matter of discipline. For instance, look at Manasseh. Yes, he sinned, sinned horribly. He put babies to death, sacrificed them. And yet he was captured and treated terribly, he was tortured, and he was brought to repentance. So suffering for King Manasseh corrected his behavior 
In some cases, it is constructive. Like David, who said he went into the sanctuary and then he understood things. Or look at Job, who went through terrible suffering, but came to understand the sovereignty of God. Now, in other cases, it's solely for the purpose of God's gaining glory. And that is exactly what it is in this situation. In this particular case, Jesus said it is for the purpose of the works of God being made manifest. So suffering is indeed a major biblical topic. There's some uh, books in the Bible in which that's the major topic of that particular book. And nearly all of the books of the Bible mention it at some point. Look at this verse from Lamentations 3. I think it is one of the key verses in regard to human suffering. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. Simply saying, yes, God does cause it, but he does have compassion and he doesn't afflict from his heart. That is, he doesn't uh, have joy out of uh, afflicting grief upon people. Or look at James. He even gives a reason here in James 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Or Peter's statement in 1 Peter 1, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's some comments by Calvin on suffering. Uh, he says, let's beware not to inquire into God's judgments beyond the measure of sobriety. Think again of that passage from Lamentations. He does inflict grief, but he doesn't do it out of a sense of joy. And we cannot ascribe some particular motivation uh, and some particular purpose for a specific situation. Now, it is true. All human suffering arises from sin. Again, these are the comments of Calvin. When judging, Calvin says, one should start with himself before you even consider somebody else. And he also says that God often treats his faithful more severely, not because they have sinned more, but that he may mortify the sins of the flesh for the future. That's sanctification. And then sometimes too, he is not concerned with their sins, but only testing their obedience or training them to patience. Good words. Now let's look at the setting of this healing of the blind man. Jesus is still in Jerusalem. This is past the time of the um, Feast of the Tabernacles. And it is the first time that the disciples are mentioned in connection with this visit. Now, we assume that they have been there with Jesus all along, but there's been no occasion for John to mention them. They're mentioned at this point because they are perplexed about this blind man. They ask the question, well, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he's born blind? Now, there was a belief, of course, that children are punished for the sins of their parents. That obviously came from the Old Testament that said that uh, God visits the sins of, of the parents upon the children to the third and fourth generation. But it was modified by Ezekiel in chapter 18 when he said that's no longer the case. Each must bear his own sin. The soul that sins, it shall die. Now, as far as the man himself sinning, if he's born blind, it would have to be before he was born. And there was a belief that... Uh, people could in some way prior to their birth commit some kind of sin of course that is ridiculous but it was a belief a common belief so that's the reason for their question so they wonder who committed a specific sin who did sin and jesus says it is not a case in which a specific sin on either part produced a specific penalty and Jesus said, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me, the work of God. So there is an imperative 
for Jesus and for his disciples. For Jesus, that imperative is expressed many, many times. For instance, John will say over and over again, and we looked at this last week, the Son of Man, the Messianic title, Son of Man, must be lifted up. That is, he must be crucified. The Son of Man must suffer many things. Again, the Messiah must suffer many things. That's an imperative. And he says in regard to his sheep, he said, I have many sheep that are not of this fold. I will go and bring them in. I must go and bring them in, uh, in reference to their salvation. So there's an imperative that rests upon Christ, things he must do to work the work of God. Why? Well, we look to a second point. That work must be done because of the need of man. There is no way that man can save himself or do anything that would accomplish that. He cannot be good enough. He cannot do works that would accomplish salvation. And a third reason, simply love. The love of others was this reason for Jesus to work. How did he work? Preaching, praying, suffering, dying. And he includes the disciples. He said, we must do the work. So the disciples continue the work after Christ's departure. Now, even though it is done through agents, Christ, his disciples, and of course, people who follow to this day and to the end of time, it still remains the works of God. These are the works of God carried out by his agents. Another thing to notice before we leave this statement, Jesus said, as long as it is day, that means there is a definite time limit for him and for his disciples. And that's a part of the imperative. Jesus had three years, and at this point, only one year is left. For the disciples, after Jesus' departure, they would continue to preach the gospel for a generation. Uh, they were martyred, all but John, the author of this gospel, but his work ended at the end of that century. So he had a time limit. We all have a time limit. We do today. Calvin makes this comment about working while it is day. He points out that people understood that when the sun comes up, that was an indication that man's labor was to begin. When the sun set, that was a time of rest. So Jesus calls the time fixed by the Father for his work as the day. And for all of us, we can look at the course of our entire lives as if it were the day. That is our day when we are alive. It's a, it's a time that's fixed. We don't know the end of it, but it's fixed for all of us. Now, what about the blind man? Well, he's an example of the light coming into his life in two ways. He could not see physically. He never had, but also prior to his encounter with Christ, he had no sight spiritually. He did not see spiritual reality. So there are two ways to think, to sit, take this. He could not see Jesus. He could neither seek or find him. He would not have valued the gift of sight. He did not pray for sight. He did not expect a miracle. Now, look at that both ways. He couldn't see Jesus physically, of course, but he couldn't see him spiritually until he understood the truth. He couldn't seek or find him physically or spiritually. He would not have valued the gift of sight. He didn't know what he was missing physically or spiritually. And then he didn't pray for it. He didn't expect it. That's true of everyone who is not saved. But the circumstance was that he was where Jesus would go. And they came into intersection with each other. And Christ made him to see in both categories. Now, why this strange method? He made mud from spittle and applied it to the blind man's eyes. Very strange. One of the commentators suggested that this would let the man know that the healing was from Jesus. He didn't see Jesus, but he, he felt his presence. He heard him. And Jesus could have just healed him going by, and that would have been it. But obviously, Jesus wanted him to have some encounter with him. He was told to wash the mud off in the pool of Siloam. And John then comments that the word Siloam means one scent or scent. Now, we've seen over and over and over again in the Gospel of John, Jesus continually referring to himself as the one sent 
by the Father. And now here's a pool that actually means one sin. Now the pool of Siloam was formed from a spring that flowed from the Temple Mount, and, and then it resulted in a pool at the base of that mount, and thus the spring and the pool were of the one sin. It's actually a genity. The, the one sin, the pool of the one sin. And since Jesus was the one sin, it has a symbolic meaning. Now, what about the fact that Jesus made mud from his spittle out of the dust? Well, some say the dust might refer to the earthly origin of man and the spittle to the divine element. It came from the mouth of Christ and the word comes from the mouth of Christ. Well, Calvin prefers the interpretation that as man was made from clay and some of the translations use clay instead of mud. So Jesus used clay in restoring his eyes and that it was in, the power, in his power to restore a man's sight just as easily as one might daub his eyes with clay. Now the results, the man washed and he had sight for the first time in his life. And he seems to have recognized Jesus. He didn't see him prior to his having sight given to him, but he recognized him, he called, uh, said a man called Jesus. He probably heard of his miracles in Jerusalem, but I think that the greatest significance here is the fact that he heard him speak. Do you remember when the soldiers, the temple soldiers were sent by the Pharisees to arrest Jesus, came back and said, came back without him, and said, never man spoke like this man. So obviously what Jesus said, the way he said it, his voice made a deep impression on people and therefore we may conclude it made a deep impression on this man. Now, subsequent to the man receiving sight, Jesus just went home. And the neighbors came and saw that the man was seeing, and they expressed the greatest of surprise. <clears throat> this is an incredible thing. And so they then brought the man to the Pharisees. So light came into this man's life in two ways. Now, this slide that you're seeing now, we've seen before, but I, I put it up for us to again, review this fact of light, because light is a major topic with John. Verse 4, chapter 1, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Chapter 1, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. <clears throat> he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. Chapter 1, verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Chapter 3, verse 9, uh, in Jesus' explanation to Nicodemus, and this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And then we saw in chapter 8, Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. He'll have the light of life. And we see that he repeats it here in this chapter. Now. Coming back to the text, and guess what? The Sabbath becomes the main concern for the Pharisees once again. Let's look at verse 8 and following. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but it's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how are your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went, washed, and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. 
Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. So the blind man is before the Pharisees. The matter of the Sabbath comes up again. Now, Jesus, of course, deliberately chose the Sabbath to do this because he wanted to evoke this kind of reaction. Calvin says Jesus used this as a whetstone to exasperate the enemies. Now, the Pharisees do not deny this. They do not deny any of the miracles. They saw two reasons to accuse him of breaking their Sabbath laws. First of all, he was working in making mud. That was considered manual labor. Just spitting in the dust and making mud out of it was considered manual labor, and that's a violation of the Sabbath, a violation of their traditions of the Sabbath. And then when he healed the man of blindness, he also worked. Now, it was permissible for a person to save somebody who was about to die, keep them from dying, it was not permissible to do anything to improve their health, to make them better. And that's, of course, what Jesus did. He improved his health by giving him sight. That was working. That was a violation of the Sabbath and of, of their meticulous and ridiculous Sabbath traditions. James Montgomery Boyce comments that this was horrible. And he goes on to say, any kind of religious formalism is always horrible. Now, we've seen Jesus cause division among crowds, and there's some of it here because some people didn't know that he didn't believe he was actually the blind man. But I think the focus that John would like for us to see here is the division created among the Pharisees. There were two groups. Now, the first group concluded that Jesus was not from God because he doesn't guard the Sabbath, doesn't keep the Sabbath. Now, they would be correct that one who doesn't guard the Sabbath would not be from God. That's a, definitely a correct statement. But they were wrong in assuming that Jesus broke God's Sabbath law. Jesus did break their traditions, which were not God's Sabbath law, were additions to it. And making additions to what God said is in and of itself sinful. But God never ordained these Sabbath traditions that the Pharisees developed. So Jesus did not break the Sabbath. But they're insinuating in this that there's something phony, and they're questioning the reality of the sign itself. Now, the second group correctly argued that an open sinner could not do these signs. And the Pharisees degenerate, because they operate, as they usually do, from a false premise. They start from the view that Jesus is not from God. They question the miracle, they call Jesus a sinner, and they pronounce Jesus both blind and sinful in the verses that you see there. As we continue through the study, we'll see that. Now, it's interesting how they conduct a hearing on this matter. Strange, they would have to conduct a hearing when a wonderful thing is done, that a blind man is given sight, and this has to be regarded as a possible criminal investigation and they interrogate his parents. And so we come to verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who'd received the sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. 
one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, well, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone who is a worshiper of God does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. So let's look at the testimony of the parents. And we'll look at the testimony of the Pharisees, and we'll look at the testimony of the former blind man. First of all, the parents. What they said they did not know, and what they said they did know in regard to the questions of the Pharisees. The question was, is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? So what they said they did and did not know. First of all, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. That they know. But how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for himself. So they said, we know it was, he's our son. We know he was born blind. We do not know how he sees. We do not know who opened his eyes. And I suspect they did, but the answer of why they didn't answer the Pharisees was given by John. As he explains, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Well, let's look at the Pharisees for a moment and what they said they knew and did not know. Obviously, they're acting in an obvious attempt to discredit the man's testimony. Really, they're attempting to prove that the man never was blind, and therefore no miracle was performed. So they called the man in who was not present when they interrogated his parents, so he didn't hear what his parents said. And they claimed to know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. We know this. And they claimed to know that God has spoken to Moses. We know that. But they claim not to know where he comes from, and now what they wanted to know that they did not know is, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? They really are attempting to force this blind man into submission. They're trying to discredit Jesus, and they are trying to assert their authority over him, of course, and over all of Israel. So they say, give glory to God. Now, put this statement with the following statement, and what they really meant in saying this was, give glory to God by now telling the truth, and this is the truth, which we now positively know, and we are the people to know, that this man is an open sinner. They wanted him to say that. By their foolish proceeding, these Pharisees start this beggar toward doing his own simple, straightforward thinking and toward drawing his own conclusions. That is very important. Their opposition is merely the impetus to his thinking and reaching a point of faith. Linsky says, they count on their superior authority to effect submission on the part of the beggar. And part, Linsky says, part of their strategy is psychological. They never refer to Jesus by name and they always speak of him in a derogatory manner. They want everything to do, every inflection, every comment, to uh, suggest that Jesus is not what he claims to be. So let's look at the testimony of the blind man. He's the only one who gives truly straightforward testimony. 
direct answer, but also sarcastic. And I don't blame him for being sarcastic. And it's interesting that he has the courage, this, this beggar has the courage to stand up to these self-righteous Pharisees. And he does so quite well. He says, for instance, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Now, in his testimony, he testifies to things he did not know. Specifically, he says, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. There was no basis for him to make that judgment. And what he testified that he did know was, he said, one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. That he knew. And then he added a little more sarcasm. And I think he was emboldened by their helplessness. He saw that they couldn't answer. They were confused. They were looking for something to say. And so he put them further on the defensive when he said this. Why, well, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. So God does not hear a sinner. Actually, the word translated here, used here, translated sinner, means an open sinner. And the major premise is, and the Pharisees and beggar, beggar both agree, that God does not hear open, flagrant sinners. God hears God-fearing people. But there's another premise here, which is enunciated by the beggar. No one has ever worked this kind of miracle. No man of God has ever worked this kind of miracle. Certainly no sinner has ever worked it or could ever work a miracle so great as opening a blind man's eyes. Really, God would not empower a sinner to work any miracle. Thus, the beggar is drawn to the inevitable conclusion that if Jesus were not of God, he could do nothing. So in consequence of his testimony, he was excommunicated. He was kicked out. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. It seems his greatest crime was apparently trying to teach them. Now, when one was excommunicated, it refers to one who is expelled from the religious communion of Israel, cut off from all its blessings, hopes, promises, was like a pagan or a Gentile for all time. Linsky says grave civil and social disabilities were as a matter of course connected with the ban. Aposynagogos would be treated as an apostate who was accursed under the harem or ban. Now, Jesus has been absent through these events. He had gone away, but he comes back into it. And there's some interesting things that are said in a conversation between him and the man who was healed of his blindness. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Now, light and darkness are further illustrated. That's the theme that we see really throughout the Gospel of John and certainly in this chapter the interplay of light and darkness, both spiritually and physically, in the story of the blind beggar and the Pharisees. Now, though we have this matter defined in physical terms, such as sight and blindness, we would understand it spiritually. So those who see, indeed the Pharisees, those who 
claim to see in a spiritual sense are confident that they need nothing and that they're right by their own standards. They consider the teachings of Jesus foolish. They're guilty of sin in rejecting Jesus. Thus, in the category of the Pharisees, everyone who thinks they see the truth when they don't. And then the blindness here must be taken spiritually as well. Yes, the, the beggar was formerly blind, but there's such a thing as spiritual blindness and people who are spiritually blind and come to realize it. You see, people who, who, who claim to see when they don't see spiritually are the Pharisees, but people who uh, are beginning to see because of the fact that they have been born again, like the beggar, are people who will admit that they cannot see. They've met Jesus and they consider his teachings comforting and reasonable. They have obeyed Jesus, anointed their eyes, come to living water, taste of bread of life. They grow in knowledge and worship him. And the beggar is an excellent example of that. Let's look at the spiritual progress of this beggar. And it's interesting because it is the development of faith even when Jesus is absent. Now, the first stage of his development, he said, a man called Jesus anointed my eyes and told me to go wash. A man called Jesus. That's a step. Secondly, when he was being interrogated by the Pharisees, he said, he's a prophet. So his faith advances. Then he claimed that he understood he was from God because he, no one who is not from God could work such a miracle as he did. So I understand he is from God. And then finally, as we see in verse 38, he confessed his faith in Christ and he worshiped Christ. So we had quite a journey of faith, but it's actually helped along the way by the opposition from the Pharisees, because each time the Pharisees try to stop him and discourage him and try to uh, insult Christ and uh, de demean Christ, it causes him to evaluate the situation and his faith grows. Their behavior incited him to think. And so uh, we come to the end of the Gospel of uh, John chapter 9. We have several more chapters to look at in future studies, including the 10th chapter, uh, which deals with the Good Shepherd Sermon, which is another one filled with great theological truth. Thank you for joining us today for our study. And uh, I do pray that you have a blessed week, that uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you today, this week, and forever.